Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Total War Warhammer 3 Legendary Lord Law video. And today we are talking about a cold Hellbrass. But just quickly, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this video, do consider joining or subscribing, or even just dropping a like. Any little bit helps the channel. Got some exclusive content for our members already in the member section, including our ongoing Malice Darkblade series, and we are revisiting the old retro game Shadow of the Horned Rat. But other than that, please sit back and enjoy, and today we are talking about a cold Hellbrass. There was a time, many years ago now, when the nightmare of folklore, Eckhold Hellbrass, was the respected son of the Graf of Reichland, living in his father's mansion house in Altdorf. Back then, Eckhold had everything a young man of the Empire could possibly want. Wealth, power, a beautiful fiancé, and a commission within the Templar Order of the Jade Griffin. But these good things were not to last. Akold had always believed that there had to be something more to existence than the petty bickering and selfish politics of city life. Despite the fact he'd found little evidence of that something more in all his 26 years of living. In his quest for a better way, Akold embraced the Empire State religion with a passion, seeking to devote his life to the service of the Heldenhammer. But over time, he found even the teachings of Sigmar's Holy Church lacking in that they promised little, but expected much. They taught that there would be no cessation to the pain and pettiness of this life, and even after death, there could be no guarantee of peace or an afterlife. So grave were the horrors that beset mankind. It seemed that the lives of men were doomed to be spent in the pursuit of petty things for an uncertain reward. Day and night, Eckhold prayed to Sigmar, begging the first emperor to show him how he could change the world for the better, to make a difference. But no answer came. Then, as Akol's hopes of ever finding the knowledge he sought had begun to fade, a drinking friend of his introduced him to the Brethren of the Golden Eagle. Akol saw at once that this was what he'd been looking for all his life, the Brethren were dedicated to the notion of changing the world, and their every word and endeavour stretched towards this end. The Brethren's preacher was an intelligent and urbane man by the name of Melek Rosencrantz. He was a magnus of considerable skill and power, easily a rival to the initiates of the Colleges of Magic, able to change base metals into gold, heal wounds with a word, and change animals into new forms. Here was a man that Akold could follow. The young knight was certain his prayers had finally been answered. The rituals of the brethren called upon a great lord of change, beseeching this divine being's aid so that improvements might be found in this world and in this life, rather than on the uncertainty of the next. Eckhold's intelligence and powerful personality soon earned him a position in the brethren's most secretive third circle, and before long he was initiated into the many secrets of the coven. Then. One night, the Templars of Sigmar raided his cult's hidden shrine. Eckhold only narrowly escaped their clutches, but under the interrogation of the witch-hunter captain himself, one of Eckhold's fellow acolytes broke and revealed the names of all the members of the coven, his amongst them. The young knight's commission in the Order of the Jade Griffin was revoked, and his fellow knight came to arrest him and bring him before the authorities of Sigmar. Akol begged them to listen to him, but they cared nothing for his excuses, and came at him, weapons drawn. Three of them died under Akol's sword, and the other two were so badly wounded that they would never fight again. But no one could doubt that Akol was the most talented swordsman of his order. He fled through the streets of the Empire's capital, pursued by his former friends, the Town Watch, and the feared Templars of Sigmar. In his desperation, he sought refuge at the house of his betrothed, Lady Joanna von Lieber, but even she had barred her windows against him. He tried to explain the unjustness of the assumptions made against him, and why he had been declared an outlaw, but the lady did not want to hear him, and she declared that she did not ever want to see him again, accusing him of bringing disrepute upon her family and their standing in society. Eckhold knew then that but for Validus, his war horse, he was truly alone. With little else to do, he headed for the river gate of the city. 
Without pause or leave, the once knight rode down the guards and took the north road at a heedless gallop. Before long, he found himself beyond the borders of Reichland, but Sigmar's witch hunters were always close at hand. Forced to live like a beast of the wild, he slept in the darkness, in the deep forests, and travelled by night to avoid the eyes of the curious. His food he stole or bought from roadside farmers, and he avoided every town and toll gate. All the while, the humiliation of his fall from grace made his blood run hot. At the borders of Osland, one of Sigmar's Templars finally caught up with him, and a crossbow bolt intended for Eckhold's heart narrowly missed taking his life. Only by throwing his great sword, an unthinkable deed for a knight, did he manage to kill the witch hunter before one of his crossbow bolts found its mark. The two-handed sword had struck his foe squarely in the chest, and Eckhold had barely managed to recover from the attack before the ferocious hunting dogs of the Count of Osland appeared snapping at his heels. Perhaps fate had been unkind to Eckhold. After all, the young man had only sought to escape the monotony of his jaded and dull existence as a young nobleman of the Empire. All around him he had seen the decadence of the Imperial capital, the filthy streets and the hopeless mobs of the poor, begging and scrapping out a miserable existence in the hovels and disease-ridden slums. All he had wanted was a chance to change everything, to begin anew, start afresh, to cast down the old corrupt society and be part of building something new, something better. But this was not to be. His life was in ruins, his father had disowned him, and his friends turned against him. He had been driven now beyond the borders of Kislev, to the very edge of the civilized world, fleeing for his life with a price on his head. All he had left were his weapons, his strong sword arm, and his will to survive. They would have to be enough. He was about to enter a troll country, and none would dare follow him there. Eckhold travelled northwards for seven days before he encountered any resistance. He had seen the groups of misshapen creatures in the shadows of the tree line or upon the distant horizon, but they had never sought to approach him. They seemed content to watch. Why? Eckhold did not know, but until they became a threat, he decided to pay them no mind. As he travelled onwards, the trees grew thinner and thinner, and the land grew ever rockier. After a time, he came across a great monolith, a standing stone carved as if by some titanic hand. It was inscribed with sigils and runes that seemed to glow in the gathering darkness. Though he could not say why, he knew that the carved slab was of vital importance to him. He had to know what was written on the monolith, even if it would cost him his soul. But the monolith was not unguarded. Out of the crude shrine that stood next to the carved pillar, a huge creature emerged. The earth shook under its great cloven hooves and titanic muscles writhed under its thick hide. Huge horns spiraled above its head, and yet the creature's body was humanoid, though massive like that of an ogre. In its hands, the bull creature carried an axe that Eckhold reckoned must have weighed almost as much as he did. He recognized the creature from the grimoires of the Brethren. This was a minotaur, a gigantic blasphemy against nature, a cross between a mighty bull and a giant man. Yet despite its brutal appearance, intelligence gleamed in the creature's bloodshot eyes. The low cunning of an animal combined with some of the sense of a man. Forcing his voice to stay calm, Eckhold told the creature of his desire and intention to study the carvings of the monolith. In coarse and barely recognizable Reichspiel, the Minotaur replied that only the Chosen One could find the path, and that all those who could not change must perish. Then, bellowing a battle cry, the Minotaur lifted its gigantic axe and charged. Eckhold slammed down his visor and spurred Validus to a gallop. They thundered towards each other, man and beast, one screaming the battle cry of an imperial knight, the other bellowing and snarling in the dark tongue of chaos. They struck. 
Echold's lance pierced the Minotaur's left shoulder, its wooden haft shattering with the force of the impact. Rearing upwards, Validus lashed out with both iron-shod hooves and crashed down against the Minotaur's skull, but the creature's gigantic axe had just as great a reach as Echold's lance, and its swipe was blindingly fast. It hit Echold's rising shield, but the tremendous force of the blow ripped it from his hand, leaving his left arm numb. The Minotaur swung again with its free hand and its massive fist, perhaps twice the size of Echold's head, smashed the knight from his saddle. Echold crashed to the ground, the air driven from his lungs by the force of the impact. With a furious roar, the Minotaur tore the steel tip of the lance from its shoulder and threw it to the ground. Thick blood oozed from its wound, but the creature seemed not to notice. With blood-red eyes and crimson foam pouring from its mouth, the creature bellowed once more. All vestiges of sanity had disappeared from its face. It rushed towards the fallen knight, swinging its axe in a huge arc. Its axe struck a stone where Echol's head had been, but a heartbeat before. And such was the force of the blow that the blade of the axe cracked, and a half snapped in two like a dry twig. Echold regained his footing and scrambled towards Validus. He drew his sword from the scabbard hanging from the horse's saddle, but the Minotaur had been just as quick. Two mighty arms closed around Echold's chest, squeezing him until his armor creaked and he was lifted above the head of the Minotaur. Though his ribs threatened to break and his strength faded, Echold swung his blade downwards. It struck the Minotaur in the neck, cutting muscles, severing tendons and sinew, and splintering the bones beneath. A cry of fury and pain cut the air as the Minotaur toppled forward. Echold hit the ground alongside it. The world seemed to spin and go dark. When Echold woke, the Minotaur was nowhere to be seen. Groaning with agony, he rose to his feet and staggered across to the monolith. Despite the pain, he still felt driven to see the carvings immediately, as if forced by some unseen hand. As he looked upon the swirling designs and jagged ruins that covered the monolith's surface, Echold realized that they formed a picture. Stepping back, he began to make out the shape of a knight, with the device of a rampant griffin on its shield, the same device he had on his own. The former knight studied the ancient carvings, and while he was no expert, he was sure that judging by the wear of the rock, they had been made several centuries ago. And yet, undeniably, the knight carved on the stone was supposed to be him. A chill ran down his spine. He turned his back on the monolith. Days passed, and Echold rode further north. Here was a place unfit for mortal men. Only those who pledged themselves to darkness could travel safely. Yet Echold sensed he could still choose his path as if he stood at the very edge of sanity, but not yet crossed to the madness beyond. He knew that this was his very last chance to turn back and rejoin civilization. He could ride to Tilia, or the land of the border princes, and offer up his services as a freelance to one of the countless mercenary bands of the old world. He was strong and fast, well-versed in tactics and strategy. With a little luck, he could quickly win fame and fortune, and soon lead a mercenary contingent of his own. For a long while, Echol held Validus in place, and then making up his mind, spurred the horse onwards, to the north and the darkness. It might have been his imagination, but mocking laughter seemed to whisper upon the cold wind as he rode on. Day and night lost all meaning. The eternal darkness of the chaos waste was lit only by the strange lights emanating from the far north. Each time Echold blinked his eyes, the landscape appeared to have subtly changed. When he tried to focus his eyes on any landmark, it seemed to almost flee from vision, and things he thought would take minutes to reach 
escaped further and further into the distance, no matter how hard he galloped towards them. Water now could not quench his thirst. He yearned for something of more substance, something he could not yet name. Neither did he feel the need to sleep anymore. He felt wide awake, and his senses were sharper than he had ever dreamed possible. He felt no hunger. He felt strong, healthy, and fast. Stronger and faster than he had ever been before. His warhorse Validus had also changed. Its teeth had grown sharp, and it no longer shirked back with fear when one of the foul creatures from those endless plains approached. Its eyes glowed red in the eternal darkness of the Chaos Waste, and its hide had become darker, as though as leather. Ecold noticed that Validus's tongue was now as rough as sandpaper, and had grown long and forked. The steed no longer brushed its nose against Eckold's face, but always stood silent and unmoving when they were not riding. The unearthly wind of the waste was full of sounds, strange voices that whispered to Eckold about all his noble and evil deeds, as if warring for his attention, perhaps even his soul. But one voice was stronger, and it drowned out all the others. Be strong, it would say. Only the strong are welcome. When one day Eckhold cried back to the hissing whispers that he was strong and that he feared nothing, mocking laughter returned in answer. Then the voice whispered to him once more, Then show me, gallant knight. Prove to me your courage. On the horizon, a gigantic shape loomed from the darkness. It was a gateway that stood on top of a long flight of steps. It was a gigantic altar, perhaps erected by the giants of ancient times when the world was young and the gods of chaos first turned their eyes upon it. In the sky above the gateway, flames danced, forming the shapes of eldric runes, not unlike the ones that Eckhold had seen on the grimoires at the Temple of Sigmar, hidden and locked away from ordinary folk. But as a part of his training, Eckhold had learned to decipher them, and so read aloud the message written in the sky. Shamelna Zenith, at the Thousand Taxith. Then Eckhold dismounted and started to climb up the stairs. On and on he climbed, higher and higher, until the air grew thin and the cold clouds whirled far below him. Despite his heavy armor, Eckhold felt no fatigue. At the top of the stairway, he gazed around him. He had come to the end of his journey. The gateway before him seemed to be made out of a polished silver, reflecting the grim darkness and dancing light of the Chaos Waste. Eckhold stood before the portal and stared at his mirror image. Looking back at him was a young, handsome Templar in burnished armor, holding a shining sword with a jade griffin set into the pommel. This was what Eckhold could have been, something he had now lost for all eternity. The mirror image spoke. I am the guardian. I am the defender of humanity. You are an abomination. With that, the reflection stepped out of the portal with its sword raised in a knight's salute, and then it charged. So swift was the attack that Eckhold barely had time to defend himself. From the first blow, he knew that his life was at stake. Never before had he met a man who could match him in a sword fight, but this warrior, from beyond the mirror gate, was just as fast, strong, and skilled as he was. They slashed and struck, weaving and dodging and parrying as they circled each other warily. Now and then, one of them would launch an attack with blistering speed, only to be parried by equal skill. Eckhold was struck suddenly by the pointlessness of it all. Why did he struggle so much to defend himself? when he had nothing left to defend. But instead of giving in, Eckhold smiled, brought up his sword and charged. Both men struck. The Templar sword sliced through Eckhold's armor, cutting deep into his ribs. But Eckhold's sword took the Templar's head from his shoulders. As the body of the White Templar fell, blood gushing from the stump of his neck, Eckhold sank to his knees, his own lifeblood oozing through the gaps in his armor. He was dying, and he knew it. 
Yet he had come so far, seen so much, too much to let it all end in that moment. Agonizingly slowly, he began to crawl back to the portal, leaving a trail of blood behind him. Now, the silver of the mirror showed no reflection, only the multicolored flames of the chaos waste on its surface. Echo touched the portal surface. He knew his own death waited on the other side of it. Yet still, he had to continue. As the world seemed to spin around him, he heard the voice again, only now it seemed to echo all around him. The way lies beyond the portal, yet only the chosen one may enter. Are you he? For one final time, Eckold felt a pang of guilt. For one last time, he longed for his former life. But what had he to go back to? His past was as dead to him as the headless Templar that lay behind him. Finally, Eckold pushed against the surface of the mirror portal. A searing pain, like lances of pure white fire, ripped through him. He screamed in agony as he felt talons, hotter than hellfire, colder than the void, tearing him apart, separating flesh from bone, raking his very soul, and obliterating whatever was left of his sanity. Then all sense and feeling left him. Eckold, the son of the Graf of Reichland, was gone. The newly born champion of Zinch, standing before the mirror portal, turned around to study his new form. The pale reflection in the mirror showed a face quite unlike the young knight who had left Altdorf all those months ago. Two eyes glittering like multifaceted gems and burning within a balefire stared back at him. His armor was covered in twisting runes that glowed in the flickering darkness of the chaos waste. His sword gleamed with blue light and seemed to moan as it moved, its shape changing with each motion. Echo began to laugh. He raised his sword, lifting it in a challenge to humanity and all the things he had once held dear. His laughter turned to a scream of hatred and vengeance. I will return, he cried, but now I know the truth. And so it came to be that Hellbrass was reborn with a most unusual gift. The gift that is known as the breath of life. Where Eckold walks, the grass springs green and meadow flowers bloom. When he walks upon the desert sands and stony rocks, the land bursts into life as he passes. Any living thing he touches springs into new and vigorous growth. The long dead wood of doors and staves take root upon his touch. His touch can restore to health creatures that are upon the threshold of death. For such is the power of the breath of life. His touch is as indiscriminate as it is potent. Behind him, he leaves a trail of new life, and everything he touches is affected. While life-giving is the gift of Helbras, he slays his opponents without pity or care for their life. For he knows all life is but an endless dance of change, dictated by Zinch, the master of fate. Since his infamous fall from grace, a cold Helbras has come back to haunt the Empire many a time, and for a life-giver, has left his fair share of death and destruction in his wake. Often emerging from the shadows at the head of a chaos horde. As a result, the Knights of the Jade Griffin, his former order, have sworn to eradicate their shameful past, to redeem the order in the eyes of their patron god Sigmar, and the Emperor. From amongst their ranks rose one of the greatest champions of chaos the Empire has ever known. The tragedy of Eckold Helbrass festers like an open wound among the proud warriors of the Knights of the Jade Griffin. A cloud of suspicion hangs over the Templar Order, where one champion of chaos has emerged, others were sure to follow it was widely fought. This stain has created a culture of paranoia amongst the Knights of the Jade Griffin. Every member of the Order 
faces ceaseless questioning to ensure they do not suffer from corrupting influences. Though many years have passed, every knight of the Order knows of Hellbrass's downfall, verse by verse. To avert a similar fate, know their prey, and cleanse the reputation of the Order once and for all. In terms of the history of the Warhammer world, not a huge amount is known to us about Hellbrass until the end times, where he plays a fairly big role. But until then, there's a couple of snippets that actually cause a bit of conflict. They could be explained away, but it's maybe worth pointing them out to you guys. In the latest Warhammer fantasy roleplay book, we are told that Hellbrass fled the Empire in the year 2492. That would mean that he and his father, who was described as the Graf of Reitland, or the Count of Reitland, would have been in some way related to the now Emperor, Karl Franz. And the other thing we're known at Hellbrass to have done is to have gone to this place known as the Volcano's Heart. It's a legendary forge, not like, you know, the Forge of Vol on Ulfwan. It's a forge in a volcano, and the path he took to get there is still kind of used as the way to get there to this day, because it's the unusual mutated vegetation that leads all the way to the forge known as Volcano's Heart. Now, what he was doing there, we can only guess, no doubt a means for his master to further manipulate the threads of fate. But this was said to have taken place in 2099. Now the chaos waste time doesn't necessarily flow linearly, so it can be explained that way, but we do have a sort of 500 year difference, where he's meant to have done this 500 years before he ever left Altdorf. So that seems maybe a bit of a mistake there, but Warhammer's filled with these, and we maybe at some point have to fill in our own headcanon. For how that may have occurred. The other areas he's massively covered in is in the end times, and in the lead up to that event, it was Hellbrass who led his army as the tip of the spear in the conquest of Kislev, the bulwark that had long stymied the ambitions of the gods of chaos. It was Hellbrass who used his gifts to destroy the Auric Bastion, a vast magical barrier that had been erected by Balthazar Gelt to block the armies of chaos pouring into the Empire. And it was in the lands of the North that Hellbrass would meet his untimely end at the hands of some old friends. But that is an end time story, and as the frequent visitors of my channel know, we tend not to veer into that area, so that perhaps may be a tale for another day. Let's take a look at Hellbrass's rules on the tabletop. He, of course, had the Breath of Life special rule, as we mentioned. Now, the Breath of Life is one of the mysterious and bizarre gifts Zinch has granted to his most favoured of followers, and it meant that at the start of each Chaos turn, Eckhold can recover a single wound on a d6 roll of 4+, so a 50-50 shot to get a wound back, and he could only recover one wound per turn, and any model in base contact with him, be it friend or foe, would recover a single wound on a d6 roll of a 6. So he could actually heal his enemies, such was perhaps the uncontrollable power and potency of his Breath of Life gift. He, he couldn't really control who he was giving life to. The Breath of Life can even bring him back to life, but it can't restore any other dead models um, on the tabletop. So it would be able to resuscitate him, but no one else. And once slain, he could still recover wounds and thereby reincarnate himself. But in order to resurrect him, it went from a 4 plus to a 5 plus. So it made it a little bit harder to do if he'd already been dead. But you were meant to mark the place where he died, and so he could be returned there once he recovered. He was also gifted with the weapon of the Windblade, which is a great double-handed broadsword granted to him by his master Zinch. Like all the favours given by the Changer of Ways, it is an erratic and unpredictable weapon. It gives plus two strength to its user, but it will also strike last, so it's a bit slow on the initiative rolls. Also, before the battle, you had to roll the dice to see how the blade would behave in that battle. If you got a one or a two, it would meant the wind blade allows its bearer to walk the winds of magic and move with astounding speed, which granted Hellbrass the ability to fly according to the rules of the tabletop. On a three to four, the Windblade becomes as light as a feather in the hand of its bearer, and yet still retains its deadly power, 
and that makes the Windblade go from always strike last to always strike first. And if you roll a 5 or 6, the Windblade swirls and leaps from the hands of its wearer, striking its enemy at a great distance before returning to his hands. This meant he could basically throw the Windblade once in a shooting phase at any target within 12 inches that was within his line of sight, basically giving him a shooting weapon on top of his sword. And so those were the multiple uses of the Windblade as it played on the tabletop. That's about it for the tale of Hellbrass. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. And if you've liked the video, please do drop a like, subscribe, and maybe consider joining if you can. That would be great and a huge support to the channel. Other than that, guys, as always, a huge thank you for watching, and I hope to catch you all on the next one. All right, guys? Bye.